China is being impacted. Um, uh, they, you know, going into this crisis, they were already they were having, for example, spiking coal prices. That's a big problem for them because they get a lot of their power from coal, uh, and so they, that's been an issue. Uh, in addition to obviously the oil and gas prices are, are a problem for them. Now they had a less acute gas issue than Europe, uh, um, but you know a- Asia has been impacted by higher gas prices as well. Uh, in the longer run, one thing that looks like China's doing is that so a lot of these Western companies were forced or, or, or you know pretty much had to divest their Russian assets, uh, really at pennies on the dollar, kind of just mark them down, get out of those positions. Uh, and so China has already stated a willingness, an interest in potentially coming up and scooping up some of these Russian uh, energy commodity assets. And so that kind of continues the Belt and Road trend that China has been doing, where instead of reinvesting their dollar trade surpluses into treasuries, they've been investing them into making loans to developing countries uh, that that generally give them access to commodities or infrastructure. And so it seems like this kind of gives them an upper hand in terms of getting you know, kind of bargain priced uh, energy and commodities. So I think over time, Russia will probably be able to access a number of markets that that they don't really have the ability to select where they get their commodities from. So maybe we can look at, you know, countries like India, uh, you know, countries like Brazil. We'll see over time, the longer this drags out, I think Russia will probably be able to find buyers for its commodities. Um, But uh, during this period where they need capital uh, and, many of their assets are selling very cheaply, that does give China a window to come in and get a lot of those assets. That's why this ex- the extent of this conflict was was somewhat surprising to me. I mean, I don't think a lot of people would have been surprised by some activity around eastern Ukraine, uh, around some of those borders. But the, the extent of this attack uh, surprised me and surprised many, because as you point out, there's almost no winners from this, right? So uh, Russians are, you know, the vast majority of Russians are not benefiting. Many of them have gone over and, and fought and died. Uh, Ukrainians obviously are, are not benefiting. Uh, Russian oligarchs aren't benefiting. Uh, it's hard to see who is benefiting from this. Uh, I think, you know, if this drags out, China could be a beneficiary, uh, potentially, like the, for the reasons we discussed, that they, it kind of gives them a little bit more influence over Russia because they're saying, you know, basically Russia now has fewer options. Um, and so might be good for China. Uh, it's hard to say for sure. It also gave China kind of intel on what would happen if you tried to invade an area. Uh, it kind of gives Russia, I mean, uh, China a playbook of, okay, we need to avoid this problem. We need to avoid this problem. Uh, so I, I think they might be a beneficiary. But overall, you know, there, there are people that focus on geopolitics and cultural histories, obviously a lot more than me. Uh, so for me, it looks irrational, you know, but it, you know, it doesn't look like there's any winners to me, really. Well, what about Ukraine? Does it does it still have any type of functioning economy? Well, the economy is so partly what we're seeing is that Russia is seizing some of their you know their shipping assets and things like that. And so part of part of why wheat, for example, so expensive is one is that Russia is a big wheat exporter, but so is Ukraine. And so so to the extent that Russia is able to control large portions of Ukraine. Uh, I, I think what we're seeing is that, you know, we're kind of missing a harvest season. We're missing a planting season over there. And so that's that's going to affect uh, global wheat prices and global just, you know, agricultural in general. Uh, and then, you know, obviously it's hard. It's it's hard to function even in an inflationary economy, let alone a war economy. It's just it's very hard to have a functioning economy. You have well over a million refugees spreading into into the rest of Europe. Uh, and so it is hard to call that a functioning economy at this current time. Uh, and so that's obviously impacting a lot of that region, uh, but then specifically it contributes to the commodity shortfalls that we see uh, worldwide. Basically, as one of the, so along with soybeans and rice, I mean, wheat is a, a, a huge staple for human consumption. Now we can talk about the health of eating a lot of wheat, for example, <laughs> yeah. but, it, but, it is a, it, but it is a huge source of calories for people around the world. Uh, and it's, it's, it's in almost everything. I mean, it's in all sorts of, you know, it's not just bread and pasta. It's in, it's an input to all sorts of kind of processed foods, all sorts of of staples that they eat around the world. Uh, and so, uh, you know, for example, Egypt gets a lot of its, uh, wheat imports from Ukraine and Russia, right? So now they have like, a I think they put out, uh, basically a, 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 a restriction on exporting some of their food staples because now every country in the world has to reassess its food security and say, okay, are we getting enough? Uh, and yeah, and because that's 
when you have like revolutions, like when you have food prices go up, that's that's how you get revolutions. When people when people can't put food on the table, uh, that's when they just go out in the street and protest, and you're even willing to get violent because they kind of have nothing else to lose at that point. And so, pretty much the number one kind of priority of any of any government in the world is making sure that people are are fed and that there's no food insecurity problems, at least if it's possible. And so, spiking wheat prices. Uh, in addition to being highly inflationary in general, it's also like a big barometer for usually social upheaval, especially in some of the more vulnerable countries out there. And we seen any anecdotal evidence of that? Well, I mean, it, this this is all happening in a number of weeks, right? So it takes time for these shortages to kick in besides just price going up. But the longer this goes, you'll see higher and higher food prices. You know, the the I think the cleanest example is the Arab Spring a decade ago, right? When you know, that was correlated uh, and many would argue caused or partially caused by uh, you had a big that that's when you had kind of the last uh, 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 spike in foodstuffs. Right. So you already obviously you already had simmering uh, tensions. And it, it's often the case that the the spike in food price is like the final nail in the coffin where they say, OK, now we're going into the streets right now. We're going to protest. Uh, and so, you know, we're not, you, you know, uh, Kazakhstan had issues like that with energy not that long ago, right? That that's that's what was, was a big contributor to what sparked their protests. And so, this whole kind of wheat shortage or wheat, you know, wheat price spikes are just kind of kicking in now. But essentially, the longer they go, as you go out more weeks and more months, uh, that could trigger you know protests, revolutions around the world, as, as well as just suffering for even if there's no you know, major social upheaval in certain countries, just the poorest people have trouble affording food. Yeah. So to your prior question, so there are different types of oil. Uh, we often think of it as just oil, but there's actually multiple types of oil and there are fi- refineries that are designed to work with certain types of oil. So you can have funny situations where you have to both import and export, right? So you might have to import a certain type of oil. And even if you you know, produce oil domestically, it might not be the same type as your own refineries are geared towards. So uh, as we talked about, this infrastructure takes years to build and it's kind of designed with pretty long life cycles, decades. Uh, And so that's not something that just turns overnight. And so the United States, for example, is designed to refine, you know, uh, we have a lot of refineries, for example, that work with Middle Eastern oil, as an example. Uh, And so, you know, again, there, there are like, petrochemical engineers that can go into way more detail about uh, that whole thing and what our, what our exact percentages are. But it's important to be aware of that even in something that should be, you would conceptualize it as simple, like energy processing, it's just as complex as the global supply chains. It's like if one little piece is messed up, you know, these things that you don't even think of start to break down. Uh, and so in addition to how complex our global supply chains are, like we talked about, you know, even getting parts to service an airline, right? So uh, basically how complex that all is, all the semiconductors, all the commodities, all of the, the, the little components that, that go into all these designs. In addition, there are commodity issues. And so another example is that uh, fertilizers. So, so natural gas is a key input into fertilizer. Uh, Russia has a lot of the, the raw materials that go into fertilizers. Uh, and so that can also impact not just wheat prices, but agricultural prices across the board. Uh, and so that that's part of why this situation is so extreme is because there, you know, it's, it, there are very specific things that can cause massive shortages uh, and massive suffering if you're without them.